All right, hello. Thanks for watching and listening. Welcome back to another episode of Food Chain Wars. Uh, this is a show where we talk about really direct marketing strategies for farm to fork businesses. Um, at the end of the day, it's a competitive world out there. So our goal is to really just break down uh, different strategies that we're learning in our experience to help you go toe to toe with uh, the big guys and uh, climb to the top of the food chain. Uh, so I'm your host, Brooks Hitsfield. I'm joined as always with my brother Blaine, CEO of Seven Sons, co-host. Blaine, are you ready for another episode? Sure am. Okay, this is going to be the first scary episode in our new All Scary series, um, which is called Don't Screw Up. Uh, the whole idea of this series is to look at and break down the things that are the big scaries inside of your business. That's what I call them. And this is all very fitting because we're recording this a day after uh, Halloween. But the goal is to look at what are the things that even just from our experience, but the things that if you neglect in your business can potentially be catastrophic, like that's the whole idea. Um, so things that you can't really turn your attention away from. So this episode, we're going to break down cash flow and cash management because of course this is uh, something that uh, you hear the term all the time cash is king and blaine i'll let you just kind of go and kick off the series uh with uh, why we're talking about cash flow what makes this so important something that you really should not neglect regardless of what stage your business is in yeah um i feel like it's an easy one to forget about when you're getting started uh brooks but it couldn't be more important i pulled up these stats that i've heard before we've all heard them before but it's worth uh, remembering why businesses, why most business startups fail. So 20% of all new businesses, Brooks fail within their first year, 30% by year two, 50% by year five, and 70% failure rate by year 10. And the research I was doing, which we've all heard this before, almost all of those businesses, they don't close because they had a poor model or there wasn't demand for their product. Uh, usually the majority of the time, it's just they couldn't, they didn't have enough cash to last. Yeah. So. Yeah. And if you think about it, at the end of the day, the food industry, especially uh, agriculture is a capital intensive yeah. industry yeah. that requires a lot of cash, a lot of debt, a lot of times. So being responsible here is a big deal. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a lot of cash flow problems will plague a farm. That's just in general. So. Cool. Well, can you give an example of um, maybe an example of how a healthy business could close their doors a scenario, a common scenario where a healthy business could close their doors just from bad cash flow uh, practices? Oh, a healthy business, well, obviously a, a large account, not paying their bill. Uh, we've all heard of those stories. Um, maybe some uh, lesser known examples would just be a long-term commitment i know we're working with um one of our partners brooks that had a long-term uh, lease on a on a large uh facility that they were operating their business out of and their business model changed and because of that lease they were locked into uh something that really didn't work well with them so um uh, there's a couple examples i know for us our Number one, you know, the last 20 years, Brooks, our number one cash flow crunch was, well, it was during the startup phase. But, you know, when uh, when our parents transitioned uh, away from the conventional side of the business and sold, you know, we used to produce uh, hogs in confinement, sold all the hogs, there went the cash flow. And then we turned around and started uh, investing in fencing infrastructure and a cattle enterprise, which out of all the enterprises that we do, Brooks, that is the longest cash flow cycle. Uh, that uh, we, we barely survived uh, those first five years. Uh, yeah, that was very rough. And the thing is, is this is such a painful way to go too, because if um, if uh, your business has to close its door simply because you can't um, take care of your obligations, um, but otherwise, when looking at the financials and um, you know the balance sheet, uh, things look healthy. Um, you know, it's very frustrating because you were making it, you could have made it, and yeah. it, hindsight's going to be easy at that point. So we're trying to. Goal here is to be able to break down a few things that allow you to be able to, instead of having hindsight, uh, be proactive when it comes to not letting this get out of hand. Um, so let's see, I asked you to prepare um, uh, just some uh, examples or really just tips when it comes to better cash flow management. Like yeah. how can people stay ahead of this and I, not fall prey to? Uh, I think of these as the whoopsie moments. It's like, I could have done something about this. I wasn't watching it and it caught up to me. One thing, Brooks, that has always caught us uh, off guard and shouldn't um, has been how much inventory sometimes we will build up and hold. Um, I know uh, three years ago in particular, this was right before uh, kind of the COVID-19 pandemic happened in March, but uh, leading up to that, which it turned out to work out for us, um, but uh, we had a massive inventory problem. Um, over, 
I don't know, we had a couple hundred pallets, I believe, in inventory, and it just slowly uh, grew on us. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was finally at a point where we were looking at it, and it was scary. Like, it scared us because it, this is a perishable inventory. We have to remember we're in a perishable business. Even though most of our product is sold frozen, it still has a, a perishability effect to it and a quality. You know, you're concerned about quality at some point as well. So Yeah, that's something people – it's so easy to forget um, when you start working with accountants and stuff. Um you know, you look at inventory on your balance sheet as a as an asset. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, what's different about uh, this industry is it, it, it's, it's, a, it's asset. an ex, an asset with an expiration I, date. I think right? of like this business we have here, where the Bryce rounds hen gear. I mean, this this is steel. Uh, this yeah. is a replica, a small version of the rollout nest boxes that hen gear sells. But this inventory just doesn't perish uh, yep. in the freezer. It can last. It can last two years, and you're just fine. Value quality has not gone down. So. Yeah. Nope. It's an important thing to recognize. Cool. Uh, what else for a common cash flow I, I crashes mentioned this, to avoid? I mentioned this in the beginning, Brooks, but I know at one time we looked at our accounts receivable and it was well over six figures at one time. And uh, that, again, is something that was so avoidable, uh, but it takes someone owning accounts receivable and holding those orders back before they go out the door if you have a customer starting to get behind. so uh, And this is a, a, a touchy one, Brooks, because a lot of times – when a, a customer gets behind on their payments, your gut reaction is stop all deliveries going to them. Matter of fact, you're, you know, you're a little bit yeah. uh, mm -hmm. upset because you've spent two years raising a beef animal and uh, if someone can't manage to pay you within, uh, you know, six weeks uh, or two months, for example, uh, you've done your job at this point. And so, uh, I think what's important here is to uh, to have a process for managing it, and when it does get out of control. Uh, be tactful about how you address it. Um, one thing that we do, Brooks, is we just ask for, uh, hey, if you're going to take your next delivery, how about you pay half of one of the older invoices yeah. each time? And it may take six, eight weeks, or we've had situations where it took us almost a year using that strategy to get someone caught up. But at least we didn't tick them off and they leave us with nothing. Yeah, and the tone here is it's hard to get right and it can be intimidating when it comes to taking this step. Um, but our approach has always just been to be matter of fact, uh, yeah. about it. Um, and I think that's the best way uh, you don't have to go into, you know, a lot of times, you know, you hear from people who, you know, will just keep, uh, making exceptions for their client. Cause it's a good customer. You want to make that exception. Um, and this is actually easier to do and, or harder to do, I guess, when you're, um, it's just you and, you know, because yeah. when you've gotten all those wholesale accounts, anyone who's paying you, uh, with payment terms, uh, you landed that customer, right? So there's probably some, uh, you might personally know either the owner there or there's some buyer and you don't want to disappoint them. So sending that email. So this is sometimes easier to delegate. Um, and also I think it's just helpful to think through what does this email need to look like or what does this process needs to look like up front so that way you can just refer to it um, and you maybe even communicate it um, as part of your guys' process and, and uh, for doing business with you. So very important to not not fall behind on because especially if you're in a growth phase where you're you're growing so your expenses are kind of wrapping up to be able to scale out, expand the farm, expand um, the direct marketing side of the business. And then if you get, though your revenue coming in just a little bit slower, those two things work against each other and you can end up um, from a great situation to a very poor situation very quickly. Yeah, accounts receivable and inventory alone can create a nightmare quicker than you could ever imagine. So those are areas that we stay on top of weekly. Brooks. Yep. Literally, we have spreadsheets. Someone here at Seven Sons is looking at every single week, inventory, demand, forecasting, what's coming at us. And then someone was always managing the accounts receivable and doing a heck of a good job um, yep. here. So uh, Brooks, another thing that's been a lot of, um, I don't know, It's it's been hard is uh, managing the longer production cycles of some of our livestock enterprises. When we were doing all of our own cow calf production, you know, we're carrying the inventory of the cows, obviously, which uh, it ties up capital and cash. But then you have, when we were getting started, Brooks, it would take us 36 months uh, to finish a beef animal on grass. Uh, talk about a uh, cash flow model nightmare. Uh, that's that's not great, and I, that's not how I would recommend anyone who's getting started in direct marketing and uh, maybe regenerative farming. Uh, stay away from those long uh, production cycles. Yeah. Uh, buy calves for starters. Eventually, when you've got so much cash, you don't know what to do with, go buy some cows and uh, start raising those animals. Uh, yeah, you can always close from, that loop later. Exactly. Yep. yep. So um, I, I guess another one, Brooks, uh, you mentioned this early on, is we just got to be honest that 
are if, if you're in the farming side of this like us you have to be honest with yourself and recognize that the farming side is such a capital intensive endeavor you have to maintain uh, a discipline on what you're going to invest in and making sure that you're we've had to be careful brooks here making sure our production aspects of our business does not suck up all the capital to the point where we don't have enough capital um, and yeah. cash to turn around and invest in the marketing uh, uh, ads um, you name it I mean I, I it, it 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 really uh, pains me when I hear someone saying I just don't think I can afford say a graze cart uh, website Brooks mm -hmm. um, and and they've got you know, I don't know, all kinds of assets tied up on the production side and they've got to get this stuff sold at a higher value. They need to have, it's important that you prioritize the cash and the capital yeah. to do that. So this one's so easy because, uh, you know, you look at what everyone else is doing in agriculture and the industry and where, you know, capital expenditures are going and it's going in equipment and all sorts of things on the uh, production side of the business. Um, and, uh, the minute that you start to go direct marketing, well, you've started a, a whole new business that needs its own overheads, its own input costs yeah. in order to scale that out. And you have to recognize that. I think too many people don't look at it that way. They think, oh, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to sell it to the end customer to get better margins. Well, no, there's, there's definitely overheads and capital that you need to put to, to that in order to be successful at it. And then once you do decide to do that, you need to be able to just holistically look at your business and say, well, what's generating the most potential return? What's generating the most growth? And make sure you have capital freed up to uh, to put it um, the, in those areas. This is another one of those dividing line, Brooks, lines that I think about when I see farms and direct marketers, uh, the dividing line between the, the ones that are successful and the ones that don't make it. And generally, you you if you start asking where their capital is tied up, the ones that are struggling and not making it, they have a majority of their capital tied up in producing the product mm -hmm. versus uh, leaving f some free cash flow uh, to get the same marketed and invest in some assets, freezers, delivery vehicles, uh, ordering boxes. You know, when you order boxes for shipping online, Brooks, you don't you can't order five boxes at a time. You probably need to order five hundred or five thousand boxes yeah. at a time. You have to leave capital for that, and wherever that capital is tied up, generally that's the aspect of your business that will grow. You know, it's like it's it's like the roots to your to your business. Yep, so. yep, yep, for sure. So we have inventory making sure you're staying on top of that, not getting long, accounts receivable, um, and even just assessing the business of uh, where, where are the capital expenditures and assets tied up. Anything else that you want to share um, there before we move on? Well, I would. this one just hinges on that same aspect. Um, and this, I would say, just not trying to do it all, especially uh, from a startup phase. Um, when I say do it all, I'm referring to farms that are uh, that are really excited about this stack model enterprise, where we're going to uh, we're going to raise you know three or four different species of animals on the farm, and we're going to we're going to uh, capture all phases of production. So uh, if you're in the, in the beef business and you have the cows, the calves, uh, the whole nine yards, and, and and if you try to do that, if you try to capture every phase of the business uh, from day one, it's, it really is a very tough cash flow uh, thing to, to, to endeavor to go on. So uh, we call this death by diversity. Um, and diversity is always good on a farm. Uh, bio, biological diversity is always good, uh, ecological diversity. But to be honest, business diversity is always complicated and it's always costly. And so yeah. it's, balancing, uh, it's a balancing dance, especially when you're getting started trying to manage cash flow. Yeah, and I think that's true probably across uh, most industries, just as you continue to scale up um, the business um, and you see and you analyze businesses that have gone on that journey um, from day one to where they're at now, most likely you see a lot of complexity just move out of their business. Yeah. Um, and there might become points where you can add some things back, back because you're running profitably um, and you start new divisions and things like that. But in order to get from where you're trying to uh, from where you're at to where you're trying to go, a uh, focus sometimes is, is the biggest key and the biggest difference. Yeah, my, one of my last points here, Brooks, is uh, uh, just to, to be uh, realistic. We talked about this in one of our last episodes. Be realistic about the time frame it takes to build a direct marketing business and don't paint yourself in a cash flow corner. Uh, with that, one of the things I look back, uh, Brooks at Seven Sons, 
And it's a little different in the, the context of today, but you know, we went from either having a commodity outlet for our cattle or we were trying to develop a retail customer. And there was a time frame there where we just didn't have enough retail customers. So our product went to the commodity market if we didn't sell it to the retail customer. Now what's great is there are what I would call plan B markets. Uh, that you can sell to maybe other direct marketers that have gone before you that are uh, building a network of producers it can be a great uh, plan B market. There's other value added markets, Brooks, uh, that is better than going to the commodity market. And that's something I wish we had available to us that I would say anyone getting started needs to have yeah. the toolbox is relationships with those plan B markets for the time that the timing doesn't work out or they just have an inventory problem. So. So are there any, I don't know, a question just came to my head. Are there any red herrings for you that come to mind um, when it comes to cash management? Because, um, you know, for people listening, if you're in like a startup phase, cash might, this might be a really important topic uh, because there's not a lot of it. So I know I've seen people, uh, especially on the direct marketing side, who uh, try to get creative when it comes to uh, cash flow. Um, and I think I see it in ways where it actually can't end up hurting your business instead of helping. Um, examples I think of is, uh, you know, different marketing strategies where you use your end customer in a sense to kind of uh, finance some cash and infuse some cash into the businesses. You have the, you know, upfront CSAs. I know I've seen some different people try to get really creative with upfront uh, membership programs where someone buys a, you know, uh, membership for a season, uh, maybe it's a thousand dollars. You get a thousand dollars plus some um, in credit, and then they can use it for the rest of the year. And uh, you know, those sound good in theory as a way to uh, you know be able to manage cash. But um, I think you need to be tricky at not confusing where, well, where, what does make the biggest impact on your cash flow. Um, and for us, I think it's you know, well, growing a direct marketing business, going into consumer, getting product that's paid for upfront, yes. But also, uh, you know, the customer experience is a big deal. And we never want to sacrifice that customer experience uh, for the the benefit of any kind of internal things to help us run our business. Um, yeah, de I definitely agree. We don't want to put a barrier uh, to more customers doing business with us just uh, as a cash flow tool. I, in my mind, that's... It's not the purpose of your customer. They're not your bank. They're not uh, there to, you can cash flow your business just by uh, growing a retail direct to consumer uh, customer base. That's your, that's one of your best long-term tools for, for helping cash flow. Uh, don't trip yourself up. Yeah. There. And I think if you're tempted to do those things, um, I would first encourage you to kind of go back and assess, well, what's happened in your business to get you to where you're, you're considering um, getting creative with your end customers, um, you know, to help manage cash flow, And um, there might be a season where that's your last re your resort, um, but you should look at it in that lens and as quickly as possible, turn back to traditional means of being able to get the financing that you need to continue to scale the business. And sometimes, Brooks, when I see farms asking for uh, down payments far in advance um, and deposits, a lot of times the, the big part of that problem is just the logistics of how they're asking customers to do that. Send us a check, you know, start an email conversation. Uh, it's just logistically not a great flow. And uh, one thing that Brooke said, I'm, that we're actually using more of at Seven Sons is this, uh, the pre-order feature yeah. through Grace Cart. We're using it for turkeys this year. And so it, it puts the customer in a normal flow of doing business. Yes, you're taking a pre-order and yes, you're locking in that, that business Cash and, char up front. And, yeah, yep. and charging for that, but it's not an inconvenience. It's a better flow. Yeah. So. That's the key distinction is really analyze that customer experience. And, you know, we say yes to that for certain reasons. Um, and it's really, at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure the technology was there. And that's where this comes down to a lot of times to make sure you can provide that experience that you need from your customer. And again, it's not the, that's not the, the flow that we're trying to build our business around. Um, yes, it's right. for one-off use cases where logistically it just makes a lot of sense and is the only way to go about it. Yeah, I'm just saying if you're going to do deposits, make it super simple yep. for your customer. All right. Well, um, is there anything for anyone listening today that is something either simple or just really important that they can take action on right away? I mean, we talked about a lot of different things, but what's something that you would just encourage someone to, after listening to this episode, either today or this week, uh, they can take action on to start getting better control, um, whether it's processes, um, you know, for cash management. Yeah, I mean, just taking a moment to step back, audit uh, any long-term commitments you may have that could get you into a, a cash flow crunch in the long term. Obviously, look at those accounts receivable. Look at the inventory where where that is that your uh, for your business today. One of the 
uh, pieces of advice that I have left with, especially folks that are new getting into farming and direct marketing would be the, I call it the rule of three. So no more than three enterprises to start off with uh, during your first three years. Uh, no enterprise longer than a three month three month production cycle. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, broilers for chickens is, is perfect fits within that three months, uh, buying uh, heavier feeder feeder cattle that you can finish, uh, in the, in the fall or the summer, uh, is fits that, um, and then, uh, hold yourself to no more than three months of inventory. So three, no more than three enterprises, no more than three month production cycles, and no more than three months of inventory. Yeah, no, I like that. I think those are kind of some things for different stages of uh, where people are at. I, I really like the uh, a- assessing the accounts receivable. If you're anything like us, and I think about us going back three or four years, uh, that was the boogeyman in the business. Uh, yep. If a consultant came in and uh, you know assessed things, that was the thing that could come up from time to time of uh, that would make your eyes just widen a little bit for where that was consistently managed at. Um, and now today, you know, we have goals to have that at zero. Um, and that sounds crazy. And we have, you know, we do have uh, a decent wholesale business where we have uh, clients who are paying on uh, terms, but we have someone who is obsessed. This is a metric they follow. We report on it every single week. And our goal is to keep that at zero. So uh, that's the standard we hold ourselves to. So I do encourage you. Uh, it's not fun to do. It's one of those things that, you know, uh, probably the area of the business that is easy to just want to put off and procrastinate on. But it is something that's simple that you can just Get a plan, get a process in place, take some action on it right now. And there's a lot of potential there possibly for your situation to infuse some cash back into the business and then get a good foundation for a process then uh, to keep that down uh, long term. So cool. Well, final resources we wanted to leave you guys with. Um, uh, just a couple, you know, Blaine, I know um, for us, when we came in our early days of, of, you know, direct marketing, we didn't know anything about accounting, bookkeeping. And, you know, I, I think, you know, both of us, uh, you know, uh, you got into this right out of high school. So uh, when you look at the books back then, they're definitely not as organized as they can be. So, um, you know, we really encourage you to get help if that's you, if you don't feel like you have the, you need to have a bean counter in the, your business. And if you don't, then your beans will usually end up in someone else's pocket. So uh, you definitely need to have one. And if you don't, uh, then you need to get organized and get equipped uh, yourself or even outsource it. So I have two resources here, Ranching for Profits. I know that that was definitely a really good, um, uh, they've got workshops and it's just an organization that does a lot to teach you and equip you when it comes to being smart about the economics of your business, what's really driving the economics. And you talked about that earlier of really assessing where do you have capital tied up. Yep. And I know that kind of just really had a lot of light bulbs click for us. And we made some pivotal changes after, um, I think it was you and Blake who attended that school. Uh, when was that? Was your- oh, man, I went, it's probably close to five years ago uh, now. Um, it's expensive, but I mean, worth, worth Every, every bit of it yep. so ranch profits we'll put that a link in the notes wherever you guys see this and kitchen table consultants this is a consulting firm um and again none of these uh people that we recommend at the end of episodes uh, we're getting any kickback from they're just folks that we know our clients are getting good we value should from. get kickback <laughs> well we'll get on that okay uh we're talking about cash flow after all right uh, it's another lever yeah, to pull right. uh kitchen table consultants uh, this is a consulting firm um and really they uh, one of their big things they they help out with a lot but they really focus on financial consulting and they, i know they even provide some fractional uh, accounting and bookkeeping services so if this feels like where you just don't have the capacity to spend more time here well, it is an area that's worth an investment. So if that's you, uh, reach out to those folks. We'll keep that in the notes as well. Uh, Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, Nope, none at all. Cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks again for watching and uh, tune in next time.